Well, hello everyone. We are doing a recording of the webinar that we created for the project for subject or Senate Bill 5515. Uh, we had the um, meeting with this, but unfortunately we had some technical issues. So we're doing an additional just recorded episode with uh, no audience, which will be a lot of fun to try to figure out. So <laughs> hopefully we've, we're gonna wrap up some questions very nicely into this that we had during that original um, to make it more comprehensive now that we know some of those areas we weren't so sure about. So um, again, welcome. My name is Mel Morris and I'm one of the two program managers for this project. And David Sherrington, who's also in this meeting is the other program manager. David, do you have any, wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, David Sherrington. I've been working alongside Mel on this project with more of a focus on the, the research and data analysis end of things. Um, among other things, that's entailed taking a closer look at you know, other states, uh, seeing what level of oversight they provide their residential private schools. Uh, and of course, taking a closer look at residential private schools uh, here in Washington, as well as their accrediting bodies, uh, seeing what uh, rules and standards they're currently operating under. Uh, and how that might align uh, with the legislation that is in Senate Bill 5515. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would just say that between the two of us, I think we've both, you know, been in licensing a very long time, probably well over 20 years. So it's our wheelhouse is usually foster care licensing and group care licensing. So this is new to us, but we're really enjoying learning more about schools and residential private schools. Um, our Supervisor is Dr. Sonia Stevens, and um, she's unavailable for this recording, but was at the original meeting. And um, again, the other people we're hoping to be a part of this project are all of you, the public. Um, negotiated rulemaking is really set up so that everyone has a voice in the rulemaking. Um, we are not the subject matter experts. We're going to try to do the best we can to gather as much information from those folks that are and put them into the, the rules, but it's always helpful to have people there that might find things that we don't understand or don't know enough about. So appreciate everyone coming in and watching this, this uh, presentation. Uh, the meeting will be set up with um, just the origin of the project, why we had this Senate bill, the process of negotiated rulemaking and how all of that's going to look, and the expected timelines and contact with outside and internal uh, subject matter experts. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna start with the origin of the project. You wanna go to the next slide. So uh, I, I would say that for a very long time, DCYF has been aware of some gaps in the system when it comes to child welfare for children that are in kind of private school or Kind of unlicensed settings. Um, and that's just been a gap that we haven't known how to fill. Um, if you are not licensed through DCYF, if you're not considered a group home, um, then up until recently, LDCPS, which is our Child Protective Services for Licensing, was unable to go out and investigate any allegations of, allegations of child abuse and neglect. Um, so in 2019, a school opened in around the middle of the state and they had a capacity of 50. Their main demographic was um, troubled teen boys. They were unlicensed and unapproved by the School Board of Education. Um, and that's the other maybe monitoring body that might be involved with these schools is the school board, but they if they don't approve as a private school, then it's also not inside their wheelhouse to be able to look into and monitor these school settings as well. So the allegations were pretty varied, but in appropriate discipline leading up to what we consider abuse and neglect, um, medical neglect, not seeing to their medical needs, the educational system, again, school board was uh, not willing to approve them as a school because they didn't have a very good educational system. And they were abusive towards LGBTQIA residents. Um, so we, you know, all intakes came in. And when I say intake, that's when someone calls into our child abuse and neglect hotline. Those are called the intakes. And when those started come in in 2019, you know, we, it was very hard to figure out how we had jurisdiction. Um, law enforcement is also involved. They of course always have jurisdiction of any kind of criminal 
abuse or neglect charges. But um, when it came down to us, it was difficult at first to see if we had any jurisdiction. But because they were unapproved as a school, it was determined that they were really an unlicensed uh, group home, which put it in our jurisdiction. And so we were able to go in and investigate. And by the end of the investigation, there were founded findings for abuse and neglect, and the school was eventually closed. Next slide. So um, that led to, I think, a lot of a spotlight on these gaps in our system and ability to make sure kids are safe in these, these schools. And so they created this the bill. Um, this slide is really just letting you know that right now we are really in the information gathering section still. We're doing pretty good, but we have been using websites, data collection, interview conversation with subject matter interest, you know, and interested parties, such as the schools themselves, accreditation bodies and everything. So just a disclaimer that this information is current of what we know right now, but we're continually learning and finding new schools that fit within this pro project. Yeah, yeah, and I just added, and looking yeah. forward to learning more, you know, as soon yes. as we're able to, we've heard back from, uh, I think most of our schools at this point, but, uh, you know, as, if we can hear back from, from everybody and, you know, anything and everything you have to share with us pertaining to this project, it would sure, yeah, sure be helpful. So look, we're looking forward to that. All right, next slide. So I think probably if there's any school people watching, you already know this, but for anyone that's not aware, um, private schools um, are either approved, can be approved by the school board of education, the state board of education, and or, and not or, accredited by um, an accrediting agency that was approved by the state board of education to accredit within the state. And so a lot are have both of those going for them. Um, you can't be accredited without being approved by the school board, the state board of education within Washington. Sounds like other states have different criteria with this, but for us, um, Washington state says in order to be accredited here, you also have to be approved by the state board of education. Uh, but you can be unaccredited and still open here and approved by the school the schools. So it's a little bit of a definition there. Do you want to go to the next slide? So the broad view of the Senate bill, uh, I won't bore you by reading all of this, but it really gave oversight for LDCPS. Again, that's Child Protective Services, but the licensing, we have special uh, investigators that are um, I guess more savvy around this kind of like, you know, group care setting, settings such as this. Um, it gave them the ability to go in as of January and conduct investigations in all kinds of residential facility settings. So not just schools, but residential treatment centers and, and things of that nature. So as of January, they will be able to go in and do investigations. And then, and then for our project, it also set up a timeline of you know, two years to consider and create rules around licensing private residential uh, schools that meet the criteria to be licensed. So you go to the next slide, that kind of shares a little bit more about um, our side of things. So we'll be licensing just the living accommodation of the residential private schools. Um, and again, it's really based around where they eat, sleep, bathe, recreate, or other ice reside. So it's not the school section or the educational component. It's just the residential side. Next slide. So there are a few exemptions which kind of confuse the issue and have been, I think, kind of a sticky point for all of us to learn more, kind of get the legalese down of what these exemptions are. So a residential private school is exempt from needing to be licensed by DCYF if that residential private school is accredited by accrediting body approved by the State Board of Education. And that accreditation covers the accommodations that we are also making our rules about and that those licensing, those criteria through the accrediting body are like of the same measure. So if you are accredited right now by a accrediting agency, those standards that they're using, like the way they are monitoring those standards have to be comparable to what we are about to create for us. And so it seems like right now, um, we are heading towards looking at, uh, from the information again we have right now, that 
It looks like there might not be any of the crediting bodies right now that meet those criteria. Um, but again, we are constantly learning more and kind of feeling out what these rules and requirements should look like. And it may, it may change in the future. But right now, it looks like the accreditors, um, just based on what we have been able to research, don't meet those criteria. Um, anything more you want to say to that, David, before I go to that next slide? I, probably on the next slide, but 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 yeah, mm -hmm. that, you know that I think that is that is an accurate statement. Uh, you know, at, at this point, we are aware that some of those accrediting bodies um, have expressed an interest to um, align their their standards with what we might um, have in our rules. Which, um, yeah, so we're we're just trying to figure that all that all that out through this process, and and looking forward to working with them. Yeah. So we go to the next slide. Really the, what we are looking at succinctly, and again, you know, the bill says including but not limited to, so that there's a little bit of an open area to make sure we may even hit some areas maybe the legislation didn't even think of. And so that's why they use that, that kind of more inclusive language. But these are kind of the areas in which we will be looking at creating our rules around. So the sleeping areas like the dormitories or the bedrooms, privacy for the children, based on you know developmental level and uh, age, personal storage, nutritional needs, cleanliness, social emotional well-being is you know it's a pretty comprehensive grouping. So we'll be looking at um, are they getting their social needs met, their emotional needs met, health and wellness that would cover things like medication and seeing the doctor, ADA compliance and other um, non-discrimination. Uh, areas and physical safety. So those are those are kind of the main areas in which we will be creating the rules in this negotiated rulemaking process. And as you can see again, none of that has anything to do with the educational setting. So we're not looking in the classroom setting. We're not looking at, you know, are they getting their educational needs met? That's all for the State Board of Education to continue to monitor. Or if you are accredited, the accreditors to monitor. That's That's not something that will be within our wheelhouse to continue to look at. And as Bill knows, I'm a big fan of this slide. These these areas come directly from the bill. Um, you know, keep in mind for sure the language, uh, the inclusive language, including but not limited to. But but these areas are every area that was touched on in, in the bill. And so this just breaks it down nice and nice and neat of you know some of those specific areas we're going to be getting into. And as Mel said, you know, maybe extend a little bit beyond that depending on the need. But these are the specific areas. Yeah, and we recognize too, we've had a lot of schools um, share concerns about the fact that a lot of these areas bleed into the school setting. I, I know that there's no direct delineation in a lot of private schools where this is school hours, this is after school hours. You know, a discipline, for instance, is carries over from maybe the school setting into the residential setting. So that's something we are aware of and something we are going to be looking at and defining more clearly what we mean and what makes sense for the school settings to mean when it comes down to that boundary of not kind of stepping over to something that we are not, that's not within our scope of doing anything with. So um, that is a concern we are very aware, aware of. It's a concern for us too. And we've been working with um, Washington School for the Deaf for a very long time. And that's something that we've had to work through with them as well of, you know, when is it, it's not just about three o'clock school's over and now we're into the residential side. There's a lot of stuff that happens in between. So we'll we'll continue to look at that. So next slide, we wanted to talk a little bit about structure because if you're not within DCYF, and by the way, we use acronyms so so often that um, we forget and we use, we say things that we're, other people are like, what does that mean? And so Hopefully I won't do that a lot during this presentation, but um, that's why I wanted to kind of talk about our structure because I think, you know, people know who CPS is, they know what that means, but they don't know much more than that. So we wanted to kind of go over where this project fits, where the schools will fit within DCYF structure. So DCYF is kind of, there's, there's multiple layers, but the two layers that I think matter the most here are um, the field operations side, which is probably what people are most familiar with. That's the child protective service investigators, the intake workers that take those concerns to give to CPS to go out on. And then if a child is taken into care or maybe not taken into care, but we decide to offer services to the family, those go to the ongoing case carrying social workers, adoptions workers, 
Um, and so all of that kind of is on the other side of the house from licensing um, and they handle really just the foster children that are in the system. Um, and then there's the division of licensing. And so there are two main branches right now for licensing and that's um, child care licensing, which is licensing of like the early learning and child care centers. And there's foster care licensing, which licenses foster homes, group homes and child placing agencies. And the majority of those are for services for foster children, although we also license group care facilities that are for DDA placements. Um, now I'm using an acronym and I know that I don't know, is it Department of- do you know Department what of Disabilities. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those facilities or medically fragile children, some of them, um, go to kind of group care settings that um, are private pay. They still live with their families, but they families need a little extra help for those medically fragile children. So we do have some idea of what it's like to serve children that are not in foster care, but um, this is outside of that direction as well, looking at this demographic that we are with the schools. So, all right, so next slide. So this is a little bit of a chart to kind of give you a, a deep dive of where we feel right now that the residential private schools will fit within licensing. And so we have foster care licensing and LDCPS. Um, so they're kind of up there at the top. And then all of the other things go under foster care licensing. So there's licensors that just do foster homes and there are um, licensors that license, this is where it gets complicated, child placing agencies. And those are, those are agencies that we kind of contract with to do the licensing or the certification of foster homes. We kind of outsource some of that work to other agencies in the community for folks that feel like they want to be foster parents, but might not want to go directly through the state. Um, and then also the group care licensors that license group homes. And so, um, as you can see, um, the, you know, resident private, private schools don't really fit under foster homes. They don't really fit under child placing agencies. Really, while they don't really fit amongst ever, anything, <laughs> we feel like they fit most under group care licensing. Frankly, group care, it's, it's licensing uh, building, it's licensing um, the care of children within a residence. And so residential private schools, a building is a building where kids are being, you know, cared for, and so it fits mostly under group care. And so um, group care licensors, we call them regional licensors, regional group care. And again, they license group homes, residential programs. Um, they're kind of the same thing, they just have different standards. And then quite possibly, we'll be also licensing the residential private schools. Next slide. Um, just a little bit more about regional licensing, which is, by the way, where I came from. So I have a little bit of experience with group care licensing. And um, then the majority of what I did was in the uh, child placing agencies, but this is also where I've done some work. Um, so yeah, they will, they're all over the state. They're based in every, we call them regional area within Washington. There are six regions. We just break the state up to make it a little bit easier to figure out jurisdiction and who will be oversight over whom. And so group care licensors are based in each of those regions, uh, makes it easy for them to go out if they need to do investigations of um, licensing violations, they kind of go out on those or inspections or, you know, it's time to renew licenses, they go out and, and do all of that. So LDCPS is separate from that group care licensor. They only go out when an intake comes in that meets that level of child abuse and neglect, um, they won't go out on licensing investigations. Although if they go out to a facility to investigate abuse or neglect, obviously they won't ignore a licensing violation if they're out there. So they might end up kind of also doing those as well, but they are a separate unit within DCYF. All right, next slide. So if you, I just put this in there because if anyone wanted to look at some of our current uh, rules when it comes to group care, you certainly can kind of do a little bit of research. I can tell you me and David so far have been looking at these OSPI requirements. Um, Washington School for the Deaf has their own WAC requirements. So 
in no way am I saying that uh, residential private schools will look like the group care standards, uh, but they are, you know, something we can look at that might work. For instance, you know, fire marshal code is the same for all of these. So we would be looking at that. And if it looks good, it looks good for everyone. So um, this is something people can kind of look at to get an idea of when we're saying rules, this is what we're looking at is these, these here. Yeah, we've, we've really been looking at, at everything and we, we want to continue to look at everything. And I was going to jump in on the, the earlier slide, but I guess this is uh, just as good of yeah. area to do that. Um, and I think Mel did a good job of, of highlighting the point, but I will just uh, put extra emphasis on it. We, we recognize that residential private school, schools are a distinct and separate program. Uh, while there might be some similarities, there's definitely some key differences. And that's why, you know, why we look at some of these areas and we can see the similarities. I mean, there's, there's definitely within within the rules and with what's in the legislation are going to be some, some key differences for sure. Yeah. Yes. And that's, that's an, uh, an important distinction because I know that there's been some concerns. Uh, I think some folks have done some um, looking around. And when you look at group care, you look at early learning. I, I've heard that the early learning uh, WAC requirements, which we're also looking at, but I've heard that they're pretty detailed and some of them are pretty strict. And so, um, again, by no means do we think that one size fits all for these. You know, the, you have a different demographic you're serving, you have different levels of training and expertise for staff that you have there. Um, there's so many differences that we are recognizing that and and really just, we're also looking at the rules and regulations that schools already have in place, because some of those might be great, and we would just use those to continue on. So, um, yeah. All right, next slide. Some of the examples of, of the requirements for group care are, uh, and that we may use, may not use for these requirements are staff qualifications, um, just, you know, are they getting background checked? Are they, do they have the training and professional development they need? And again, not the teachers, but the residential staff. Um, how are you maintaining child's records to make sure you're in compliance with, you know, privacy or HIPAA requirements for their medical stuff? Um, confidentiality reporting requirements. Are you reporting child abuse and neglect allegations if they come in? How are you doing that? How are you reporting incidences to parents when they when they happen environment space and equipment you know is the facility safe or you know hazards kept in areas that are away from the children um room requirements you know are making sure the rooms are big enough to have privacy for each of the kids or have a little bit of space for each of them so those are just some examples again um understanding that environment space and equipment may have some similarities with group care or with child licensing, child care licensing, but also differences. Um, and so we would be looking at that as we go. So next slide, just a few more. Fire safety, um, service planning, I think it's just about like, what are your non-discrimination standards? What kind of recreational activities are you doing with the children? Daily care, like personal hygiene meals, uh, if they have a special diet, allergies, are those being, you know, looked after and discipline methods. And again, I think looking back at the school that started it all, the concerns that came in, that's kind of what we're looking at is what could we have put in place that may have made it easier for us to get to those concerns before they became abuse and neglect. You know, um, licensing standards are there is kind of not an end all be all, but maybe a stop gap where we could see a problem before they escalate. And so that's what we're kind of keeping in mind is, um, if you have a policy on discipline methods, it makes it really easy for us to tell if you're stepping without those policies and be able to help help with that. So, yeah, we're we're, we're very well aware that uh, many of our programs already have policies yeah. and procedures in place, and uh, and in, in many cases, probably above and beyond what we'd even you know ask ask for. But uh, you know, like like Mel was stating, just to uh, having having some some level to of, of oversight there to where we can point at that and have some yeah. verification that's taken place. Yeah, and, and that's a good point because um, when it comes to licensing, we do what we call minimum licensing standards. And so we really try to make those as basic as we can to make sure children are safe. And so it may be that a lot, if not 
you know, 90, 90% of the schools will have things above what we're actually even asking. And so, you know, personal hygiene, if we say something like they have to have personal hygiene items or something like that, everyone's going to be like, well, of course they do. And so it's, you know, it's really about getting that minimum to make sure children are safe. It's not about us managing your school program for you. You know, we don't, we don't want to do that. We we're, we want to trust that these things are happening. And so we really just put in the minimum requirements and then people go above those all the time. So, um, so next slide. So we've had a lot of help again with researching these. So we really, we put Susie Hansen in here because Susie's been a great help in just locating the schools so that we can make sure everyone feels like they've been contacted and is involved in this project. Um, the State Board of Education, we've reached out to internal staff. Uh, a lot of people in, you know, we are statewide. And so a lot of times people in the local communities have information we would need about schools that might be out there that we haven't found that may need to be a part of this project. Um, and we have identified, we keep kind of waffling around 14 schools that currently fall within the scope of the project. Uh, we assume there are more out there that we just haven't found, but with the information we've gathered so far, it's it's looking like those four to 14. Um, and some of those are also in the process of being approved. So some of them, you know, the 14 counts, a couple schools that are currently with an application to the State Board of Education to be approved as a private school. Next slide. This is a little bit of a breakdown of um, the schools and where we kind of have broken down their accreditation. And so we have very few that we haven't yet. Uh, yeah, so a few of them we don't know quite yet whether they're accredited, but the rest of them we've kind of locked that down. And those are the main accreditors that are out there that are doing those accreditation. So we've also included the accreditors within this project because they also, a lot of them have standards for the residential component. We wanna make sure we um, validate that and see what their standards look like and work with them. Um, some accreditors have talked about being willing to perhaps increase their standards if they have to, to meet those requirements. So if that can happen, then it may be that schools that are accredited through them won't also have to be licensed. And so we're looking at how that would work as well um, to get that process going. Yeah. And, and hey, Mel, this is that one that I had those last minute uh, uh, updates to my crosswalk. So, so we now know that Association of Seventh-day Adventist Schools and the Western Catholic Education Association, they also have some of those uh, residential components. Um, you know, at this at this time, we're not seeing you know, in depth coverage that may align with you know Senate Bill fifty five fifteen. But they do. I, I want I want to make sure to note that we we do uh, know that there is some residential components covered by both yes. of those. Bodies. Yeah, and I think I yes. So that's what RAS meant. I put that actually. I used an acronym and forgot to tell you what that meant. So <laughs> uh, residential accreditation standards is what that means. Um, and so I so I think it's the, is it the Western that I wasn't quite sure of when I made this slide, but it sounds like we verify now that they do have some standards. So yeah, them and tri them and AAA. <laughs> okay, great. So yeah. And, and again, some of those say that they don't have standards. And we under, understand too, this is kind of hard for the accreditors because I, I think that a lot of them are either, you know, across the country or even global accreditors. And so they, you know, asking them to change their standards just for Washington state is a pretty big ask. Um, and so they may not be able or willing to, to change those. Um, and that's understandable. That's, that would be, that might be a cost to them that I would understand being too difficult. So, but we will work as we can with folks to, to see if we can make that happen to limit the strain on everyone if they're already accredited. Okay, next slide. All right, I feel like I sometimes I go and I say things early that I'm gonna say later, but they're all so important that it's fine. Um, the, we, uh, again, we understand one size does not fit all. And we have found such a vast difference between the residential private schools that we see out there. You know, the demographic of children they're serving is different. Where they're located is different. Um, their capacities, so we have schools that have in the residential part over a hundred children in living at the school. We have some that have six children living at the school. So uh, we have international students, local students, 
uh, dorms versus more home-like settings, uh, country versus city. Um, so, you know, we understand that this is going to be quite the heavy lift to create rules that work for everyone. And I think, again, that's why it's really important that we do the, the minimum licensing standards, because that way we're not using, you know, a well-established 100 student capacity school to make rules for a six, you know, capacity uh, home-like setting school. So it's it's important that we kind of keep to the minimum licensing standards and we understand that. And we're going to continue to do the work we can to make sure that fits everyone. All right, next slide. So this is the process of negotiated rulemaking. And so we'll kind of go over that. Um, we have, again, in our project scope is the living accommodations, but we will not be working with the educational component. Um, we understand again that, the, that that's a hard line to find, but we will be able to define that more clearly by the time we're done with this project and be able to say what is within our scope and out of our scope when it comes down to that as well. Um, and I don't know if it's the next slide. Okay, and so, um, Inside the scope of this project is also that the, the licensing rules are what we are creating. LDCPS, you know, they're going to start their investigations in January. So their timeline is much shorter than ours. And they've been working pretty hard at just changing our current RCW and WAC standards to make sure that they're up to date and that they show that they have the, the, the ability to go out and investigate child abuse and neglect allegations and um, that their investigators are also trained in and how those school settings might be a little bit different than um, what they're used to. Um, and, you know, it, I don't think that will be a huge change for a lot of the schools. I know a lot of you have already, you know, you're well versed in making, you know, calls to intake yourself due to maybe a child comes in and says that they ha are having experiencing abuse in, in their homes. So you, you may have already interacted with regular CPS investigation. Um, and that's, you know, that'll be coming quickly. And yet I don't think a huge change for you all at that point. Um, and, and may you may see more changes in the future than you will see right away. So that I don't think will be a huge change. Next slide. Oh, sorry. One more thing about inside and outside of scope is that the um, outside of our scope is also licensing uh, like military schools that are run through, you know, the federal government because they have their own standards and uh, tribal schools, residential private schools, because if they're on tribal lands, they're out of our jurisdiction as well. So just making that clear for folks that those two settings are outside of our jurisdiction. All right, next slide. So right now we're in the informational gathering stages. So we're, you know, really trying to understand the scope of the project. How many schools are there? What are the demographics? Who are the main contacts for those schools and the accreditors and anyone else in the community that might have a vested interest in being part of the process? It's a lot of gathering of data that David's been synthesizing and putting in different reports so we can keep track of it. Um, really looking for interested parties that want to be a part of this and making sure we have their contact information, uh, getting communications prepared to send out information once we're, when, when we get going, um, all of that takes a lot of prep work and set up along with the research and touring the schools. We were really trying hard before January to try to get as many of the school, schools toured as we can because there's no better information about schools than you can get when you're actually there. You know, we can get a lot from websites and from talking to folks, but uh, it's really important that we go out and really see people and see how things are running in person. So trying to get those done as well. Um, yeah, we, you know, we have, we, I like to just add though, we have a number mm -hmm. of those scheduled, but I, we'd like to see them all, you know, if they're yeah. possible. We, we definitely don't want to leave any program out as mm -hmm. far as, you know, seeing all the good things that are happening there and, you know, yeah. and what what direction uh, you know this is what needs to go with with the legislation. But yeah, we we like to see as many as possible. Yeah, and the impact will be better if we see them before January because that's when we're starting the NRM process, like getting going for sure. And seeing the schools before that, that means we will really have them in our heads and know them, versus you know ones that we kind of 
have some knowledge of, but not as much. And so we're trying really hard to get those done before they, of course, you know, with the holidays coming up, I, we also know that that makes it a little difficult to schedule, but anytime we can come out, even after that January deadline, we'll still be making trips out to see folks. So, um, and then we're doing lessons learned. So there's very few other states that are actually uh, licensing or using some form of licensing for residential private schools. Oregon is one. And tell me again, what are the other ones, David? Uh, Michigan and, and, and sorry, Mel, I, uh, you were just talking about other states. Mm, yes. Yeah. Other states yeah. that might have licensing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, just Michigan and Oregon yeah. as far as like a formal licensing process, as you yeah. mentioned earlier, every state has a different uh, level of, uh, of oversight for sure that they, they abide by, but a formal licensing is Oregon and Michigan. Yeah. So we've kind of looked at those as well because, you know, Oregon, I think has been doing it the longest and they did, they started in the nineties is when they started doing things. And so, you know, being in contact with them, how did, how did you unroll this to make it work for schools? What are some lessons we could learn about making this work seamless for folks as much as we can? Um, so that is also part of that research and, and collection of data that we're doing. Um, and by the way, anyone that knows of anything that you feel like we could be doing or people to contact that would get us more information, the more the merrier. So let us know about that as well. Um, and then we're also kind of researching and this will be an ongoing because obviously even after the NRM process where we really get into this, but we have current systems in place within DCYF and we have to kind of look at their workload. So regional licensors are already at capacity for what they are doing and how are we going to fit potentially 14 additional providers is what we, you know, call the group homes and foster homes and stuff. So we're going to be potentially giving them more work to do. And how is that going to look? And how can we streamline that process? Not only that process of monitoring, but training, getting them on board and understanding what um, licensing might look like for them. So that's, it's also part of what we're doing. Um, and then we're going to start, and I'm going to have a better timeline later on in the slides, but the next step is the negotiated rulemaking process. And so um, we'll be creating some committees, steering committees. David and I are currently working at just like a outline of the rules based on those headings we talked about earlier, like sleeping and nutrition and just like a basic that we can work on so that we don't show up to these meetings with nothing, like a blank page, let's start making rules. So um, basic ideas. <laughs> yeah, give us something to actually negotiate. So we're going to start doing that. And then we'll start, you know, creating steering committees with subject matter experts. So it may be, if we're talking about say medication management, you know, who from the schools would want to be a part of that, maybe some nurses from the schools or anyone else and internal folks that we might know, health department, stuff like that. And so that's what that, that would look like, we think. Um, and that's how we start that process of creating those WAC requirements. Um, we haven't really set up what those steering committees look like or how that will all kind of come about. Um, uh, thankfully we have another team, it's probably like a month or two ahead of us that are doing a negotiated rulemaking process with group care. And we're kind of doing some lessons learned from them as well to figure out how they were able to make it work to create kind of meetings that work for everyone and not during hours that won't work and, you know, too drawn out or too long or anything. So we're just going to try to figure out what works for everyone or as many people as we can. It's hard to get those big meetings together, but mm -hmm. doing what we can to make that happen. Yeah, just getting a good, good framework of ideas in place and yeah, start yeah. going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the process isn't complete without public feedback. And so once we have something workable, it goes through several layers of public feedback. It goes through our attorney general's office to make sure those new rules are legal and that they kind of encompass everything that needs to be encompassed. It goes out to just general publishing so that the everyone in the public can kind of see them. So maybe there's some parents or alumni or anyone that have some ideas that weren't really thought of. That's that's a time that if they're not already part of our committees, which they can be welcome to, maybe that's a way for them to also offer some feedback. Um, and then once all of that is done, which is a heavy load, we'll go on to the policy and procedures creation and implementation. So those rules are usually pretty open. And then we have to create the paperwork to go around them. Like maybe they're going to do an inspection checklist or 
Um, you know, there's just a lot of paperwork involved. Um, uh, IT system, we just recently have a new IT system that we're, we're having onboarding for foster homes and group homes. And so how would this fit into that so that actual paper paper doesn't need to be created, but maybe things would be submitted to us directly through an IT system. It's way faster for foster parents at this point and um, brings us into the 22nd century, 21st. I'm not even sure where we are at anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very exciting for us to have that now. So it's it'll be good to be able to just streamline this into that right away as soon as we can for the schools. And we've got some schools that thankfully have volunteered already, which is great for the, the pilot. We're going to try to do like a pilot project early enough that we can work out some kinks in the system. Um, and then final implementation. And so I'm not sure if the next slide is the next slide. And hey, just just a couple of words. I want to get on the on the pilot study. You know, kind of going back to your early slide. That, that you know, not not one size fits all. Or, mm -hmm. uh, that's what it, what it stated, anyways. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we want we we love to have some of those schools with a larger capacity, smaller capacity, urban, rural. Uh, and we are thankful that we've had some schools kind of you know volunteer uh, so far. But, but yeah, would like to you know, consider consider everyone who's interested in in that process. Yeah. All right, next slide is, again, just the goal of negotiated rulemaking, just to come to a consensus. If we created the rules internally without, you know, talking to anyone that's been doing this work in the schools, the creditors, it just, it wouldn't work. And we are understanding of that. And so this process is really so that we can get those experts to come to us and say, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And and really implement those into the rulemaking process. Um, so we try to do as best as we can to do that while also honoring that there are um, every once in a while some things that we have to do for legal reasons. And so it's that's why it's negotiation. We just kind of come to a consensus by the end of that. Um, next slide. These are just a list of right now what we consider our community partners, so the schools, uh, the accreditors, those are the listed accreditors that we have seen so far. Again, these are the accreditors that are right now approved to work within Washington by the State Board of Education and that are accrediting schools that have a residential component. So there are other accreditors in Washington that just don't have any residential schools like Waldorf schools and stuff like that. And so there are other ones, but these are the ones that actually work with residential schools right now. Um, and then external subject matter experts, that's kind of our list of that. We're you know getting a hold of fire marshals and DOH because they're already in the schools doing inspections. So what, what are their rules? What are their um, priorities when they do that? And can we just keep continue on with that? Um, tribal partners, Washington's the School for the Deaf. Again, we've already been working with them in a limited way because they're not licensed through us, but we work with them on some things. So they already know what it's like to work with us and may have no ways to make this a little bit easier. And then parents, we would love to have parents that want to be involved, involved as well. So, um, and I don't think I put it on there, but again, alumni, students that want to be a part of this in some way, we are even, even students that are still students, we would love to hear from. We've already talked to a few that was, it was great to hear from them and their experience in school. So that's nice. All right, next slide. This is our team of internal partners. And so communications, they really are the ones that get out messages, help us, you know, they helped us create a website that we're gonna share out to folks so that they can get updates on what's going on. Group care needs to be a part of this because it's going to affect them as much as it's going to affect the schools. We have an equity and social justice unit that um, will be able to come in and help and make sure that whenever we're making these rules, we're including an equity lens, uh, making sure that we are inclusive in, in anything we create. The Indian Child Welfare volunteers that may be wanting to come and be a part of this. Um, LDCPS, again, they're going to be going in to do investigations and uh, might have some idea of what rules they want to see created. Um, IT, the internal system that we created is called WACAP. So those are the folks that help us, that will help us create our IT system when it comes to uh, putting all the forms into an IT system that's that'll work for folks. And then 
There's the policy development team. So the NRM team, um, we've already been working with them on how to get that going. And government affairs who, you know, they've been with the bill longer than anyone. And so they, they will help us run through this and understand anything that we may be missing as well. So that's kind of our internal team at the moment. Next slide. All right, finally get to the timeline. <laughs> One more. Good. Yeah, okay. Um, so right now, September through the December is again, we're doing a lot of the tours right now. We're making our uh, bare bones rules that you know we think meet those requirements within the bill to submit. And then as of January, we'll start really getting into the rule drafting and negotiating of those rules. That that can take a very long time. I mean, especially if there's a lot of interested parties, a lot of different ideas of what those should look like. So we've really planned out as much time as we can without going over our overall time limit to do those negotiations, uh, filing them, getting them through the legal channels and the public comment as well. So that's gonna be that process, a lot of meetings, um, hopefully set up in a way that everyone can join that, that wants to join. And then October through January of uh, next year, we'll be creating the policies and procedures around those uh, followed very quickly by the technology to support those policies and procedures. So um, that will also take quite a bit of time to make sure we're, we're you know, setting up group care to understand the requirements that we just created and getting all of that done. Um, and then hopefully right into the pilot project, you know, getting everyone trained, both the schools and the group care to know what we're doing with all of this information. And so when I say training, I really just mean <clears throat> training on what the new NRMs are. Not every school, I think, will want to participate to a high level, so they may not know exactly what gets created. And so it might be a little bit of training on, okay, these are the new rules to follow and what those look like. Um, training on how, you know, when and how we'll come out and do inspections or monitoring visits or investigations. So that's what I mean by training. It's not training on things that schools already know or anything. So um, the pilot will be limited, but hopefully, like David said, we'll have a variety of different schools. So again, we can work out the kinks for a variety of different settings um, and then training and uh, everything. All of that will happen right there at the end. And then as of June of 2025 is when the legislature is mandated, we get going. And so it does not mean everyone is licensed as of June 2025. That means we have to start the process, which usually starts with an application and then takes a bit of time to get people through to the licensing. So if anyone's worried that by June 2025, you have to be licensed, that's not that's not correct. Although I've got to say, probably the pilot project folks will be ahead. So that's another reason maybe to be on, in on the pilot if you just want to get through that part earlier. That's a good way of doing it. Um, I know that when we did this originally, the accreditors that may be willing to look at their accreditation were concerned about the time, and we understand completely the like two years, well, it seems like a lot of time really isn't for something like this. Um, so we will work with them as, as soon as we can. Like when we see that the rules are getting really formalized and that we know the basic what they're going to look like, we will make sure accreditors know so that they can start to decide if that's something that they can, I don't want to say compete with, but you know what I mean? Like that they can find a way to put theirs at the same level so that um, maybe by that June deadline, they will also be ready to have those new standards. But again, it's a very tight fit. So there may be some that are willing to do that, but it's going to take them some time. And in the meantime, schools will have to go through the licensing process, even if they're hoping to get to be just accredited later. So they would still have to go through that. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, so the next steps, again, we're just, you know, trying to do the tours, getting a final list of volunteers for the negotiated rulemaking process. And that just means those people that wanna be more involved than just like the public is involved. So if folks are saying, you know, I really wanna be there when you talk about a certain subject area, you know, email us, let us know that you're really wanting to be a part of a certain subject or all of it or however you'd like to be involved and we will try to make that happen. 
We're going to try to find the best format. Again, it's going to be difficult with as many people as we have part of this, but um, do we want virtual or in person? I think I know I'm leaning towards virtual just because this is statewide and it would be very difficult for folks to be able to travel long distances while still running schools and accrediting and all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm thinking we're probably leaning on virtual. My guess is that we're looking at some weekly, monthly, um, just to try to get them done as soon as we can. Um, and again, schools run during the daytime. So my guess is we're going to look at daytime, but if evening works better for folks, we may have some evening times as well. So we're just going to feel around for what works best for the majority of the people, um, and go from there. And again, hopefully touring schools before January, but any time that works for folks works for us. We're kind of getting closer and closer, especially with the Thanksgiving holiday and Christmas. I know there's a lot of breaks coming up for schools, so will be a little bit more difficult as we go, but uh, we got quite a few we got started, so we're on good track. All right, and then the last slide is just our contact information. I think it is also on our website, and um, I should have had that ready to go for this presentation as well, but there is an external website for the Residential Private School Project uh, for any of the folks that have already contacted us or will contact us. Uh, we're, you know, we have a distribution list that I'm going to send out an email with a Q&A document that just shows some of the questions that came up during the original presentation and our answers to those, um, as well as this webinar will be on that website. So that's where you will find this and anything else that comes up. We're, we're really hoping to create like a monthly newsletter to put out so that folks that want to be updated but maybe can't be part of the project will still get that update on where we're at on everything and maybe join in later when they can so hopefully get that going pretty soon as well so yeah mel i'd just like to say uh well, are, are we still live yep you're nope, good oh, oh. <laughs> hey I, I would just like to say that uh, you know i think you did a really good job at covering some of those original q a questions but certainly you know if anybody has any any ongoing questions or concerns yeah don't don't hesitate to reach out you know we we look forward to talking to people we've been talking to people in the you know the prior few months and it's always uh, you know neat to hear people's perspective and, and gain their insights so yeah for sure. yeah and i think the one additional thing that came up that I meant to specify earlier was, I think some of the schools have already uh, attempted to change some of their standards based on what they think is coming. And I would caution that uh, unless you think there's a safety reason to do so, it may be good to pause on that. We wouldn't want anyone to change anything that is burdensome to them to find out that that's not something we would ever have created as a rule. So um, if you are concerned and want to just reach out to us and say, hey, we think that this might be something we should change early and we can kind of tell you whether that's something we would also say will be changed or. Um, but otherwise, just, you know, take it slow. We have we do have two years before this will be implemented. And again, like David said, any contact you want with us also helps us. You know, if you have a concern, my guess is that other schools, other accreditors also have that concern. And it helps us see those gaps that maybe we don't even know. We don't know what to ask unless you tell us what to ask. So it's it's very helpful for us when you share those questions and give us feedback. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.